Welcome back to the Reflector channel. I'm very excited and it's not just because I finally got a haircut. No, the restoration journey for this Orion XX14G Nelsonian telescope is almost done. We're just a few minutes away. You know, there were a few odds and ends that were too short to get their own videos. So what I'd like to do is a classic NASA countdown while I show you these very short but very necessary fixes that pretty much made this even better than brand new. And while you're watching those, I will drag this outside so we can get first light on the mirrors. Stay tuned. Seven. What telescope restoration project would be complete without 3D printing something? I printed these extension legs for the Telrad on my 3D printer, and they took about two and a half hours each, and I used a couple of extra four millimeter thumb screws that I had laying around. I'll put a link to the part in the description box below. Six. A big mirror requires big cooling. This telescope came pre-drilled to hold three 80 millimeter cooling fans, which mysteriously were not included. Fortunately, I was able to buy all the necessary parts from Amazon for about $30. The cooling fans can be purchased in packs of two, so I purchased a couple of those, and I guess I have one extra in case one goes bad. These fans are 12 volts, which is supplied by a pack of eight double A's. They're all one and a half volts each, which is 12 volts. There is an on off switch on there. We'll just put the cover on and our power supply is ready to go. These fans require 12 volts DC power each. I could wire them in series, but then I'd need to supply 36 volts or 24 batteries. Instead, I'll wire them in parallel. And the added bonus is if one motor dies, the other two will keep running. And now I have to do some soldering. First, I have to remove the existing connectors that came with the motors. And now I have to strip the insulation from the newly cut wires. I'm using a really cool automatic wire stripper. Funny story, I was working at Ace Hardware many years ago and a customer who was an electrician brought these in. He said they were broken and threw them in the trash while we were talking. Later on, I grabbed them out of the trash and fixed them up. And I've been using them for nearly 30 years now. Uh, they're super helpful. I'll put a link in the description below to what would be basically the modern version of these. The next step is to solder the three black wires together and then solder the three red wires together. And when that's done, I'll solder each of those bundles to the red and black wires on the 12 volt connector pigtail. Then I'll seal everything up with heat shrink tubing. At that point, we can hook it up to the battery and give it a try. Each fan came with a protective screen and four threaded machine screws that matched the threads that were pre-drilled into the mirror cell framework. The cooling fans are all done. Five. In the previous video where I've repaired the azimuth clutch, I forgot to grease the worm gear. Well, here it goes. Four. I used a pizza box to make a custom Batnoff mask for this giant 14 inch mirror because buying one that big was gonna be really expensive. So I printed out a template on several pieces of paper and then I taped them together like a puzzle. I used the template along with an X-Acto knife to cut out all those lines to create my very own pizza based Batnoff mask. It took over two hours to cut this out, and I think I gave myself double carpal tunnel syndrome in the process. 
Once I was done cutting out all those slats, then I had to fold up the edges and tape them so that it would basically hold on to the very top rim of the telescope. If you're not familiar with the bat knob mask and just how useful they are for helping get perfect focus, well, I have an entire video dedicated to them. Uh, I'll put a link to that in the description box below. But you know, in the end, I think this one turned out okay. Three. Here's a Crayford focuser. As you can see, part of it sticks into where the telescope tube is. For some reason, the telescope makers like to make this a shiny reflective silver coating. I don't know why they do that. It's easy to paint it a flat black. This is the focuser tube that I pulled out of the 14 inch Dobsonian. Basically exactly the same. It's threaded on one end. It's got the flat part where the axle rubs on it. And if you look close, you can see where the bearings rub on this. I have a whole video for the history of the Crayford focuser. If you're interested, I'll put a link in the description below, but that's not what we're here for. We're here to talk about the shiny bit. So this part sticks into the telescope. Now, most of it gets pulled out as you adjust the focus, right? Like that. But still, it's possible that some of this might be sticking into the telescope tube. This bright, shiny silver thing is sticking into the telescope tube where everything is painted black. Well, what I like to do is I like to paint the end. Oops, sorry. I like to paint this part flat black, actually, so it doesn't reflect any light. Now, if you can see, uh, inside it's painted flat black as well. And I like to use my favorite matte black paint, which is Rust-Oleum Camouflage. Uh, I think it's an enamel. Anyways, it's, pretty, it's a pretty strong paint. And I like to paint the just the ends of this to make sure that there's no shiny silver bits in the telescope tube itself. And by the way, this stuff you can buy at uh, Walmart, of all places. But we don't want to paint where the bearings rub, and we don't want to paint the axle area. So we're going to mask those off with tape. All right, and I don't want to paint the threads. So, let's go ahead and paint. Here we are, let's pull some tape off. Here's the two inch uh, eyepiece and with an inch and a quarter adapter. All right, now I'll go put this back in the Crayford focuser. Now for the final adjustments. Two. <laughs> All right, so to get the most out of the go-to system on here, I want the disc to be level when it's running. So I'm gonna put this two-way bubble level on here. First, I'm gonna mark it. They don't want to tighten it too tight because these tend to bow up. All right. One. Every truss tube telescope needs a shroud, and there are two really good reasons for it. The first reason is to keep all this outside stray light from getting in here and ruining your view. And the second reason, which is almost more important, is to keep goofballs like me from dropping tools 
or cans of soda on your mirror. Now, this shroud came with the telescope. The only problem is that the elastic at both ends is shot and it keeps falling down. I could buy a new one, but it would cost over $100 from Orion. Or I could spend $5 down at the local craft store and buy some replacement elastic bands and fix both ends. So let's get out your sewing kit and make this good as new. Okay, so here's the shroud. The good news is that here's the end of the elastic. I don't know if you can see that. It's just sewn in there. And this elastic looks exactly like the elastic that I bought from uh, the Michaels store. So all I need to do is somehow cut where they sewed it without destroying it. All right, let me get some little scissors or something. Thankfully, in the seventh grade, our teacher, Mrs. Edwards, made us all learn the basics of sewing. Thank you, Mrs. Edwards. Oh, here we go. There's the elastic band. Now I just need to release the other end. There we go. Okay, so I got both bands out, which is looks identical to this stuff. This is uh, three yards, so there should be enough. And now for the tough part. I'm going to have to fish the new elastic ribbon through the tube to replace the old one. And I'll do that by attaching the ends together and pulling them through like I'm fishing wire through a wall. We're going to test this out on the actual telescope. How about that? Oh, fudge. <laughs> it went all the way in there. Okay, so the elastic band went back up in, and I have some hemostats that I'm using. So, almost there. There we go. Now I'm going to keep this hemostats on there. <laughs> I learned my lesson. I'm going to put this on the telescope. All right, so I've got these clamps on here, and I've been adjusting the length of this elastic band to see if this is tight enough. And I think I've got it at just the right length, so I'm going to sew it while this is still clamped together. I don't think we need all this, so... All right, so, call that good. And now I just got to do it for the other end. Five dollars later and it's good as new. There's not going to be any stray light getting in here and hopefully no one's going to drop any Coke cans on the mirror. And I have to give my daughter a lot of thanks because I couldn't have done this without her letting me borrow her sewing kit. Zero. All right, so this is the eyepiece tray holder. There's a hole for the two inch eyepieces and then there's three holes for the standard inch and a quarter eyepieces. The interesting thing about this telescope is that it has the two screws installed ready for an eyepiece tray, but it didn't have an eyepiece tray. You know, of, of all the Dobsonians that I've basically bought and fixed up, something that's really interesting is that they typically don't come with the eyepiece tray. Either it was never installed or it was violently ripped out. And you can tell they're ripped out because they leave these little craters of wood and the screws are missing. And I know that uh, some people don't like to use these. I do like to use these. So I went ahead and I bought this from somebody on Cloudy Nights and I'm gonna go ahead and install it. Let's hope it's the same distance. I think it's something like seven or seven and a half or something like that. And there we go, bingo, holes line up. Job done. Job done. Lift off. We have a lift off. After collimating, I wanted to take it for a test and I was just excited to get everything out there, even though it was way ahead of time. I decided to make this an Orion versus Orion contest, and we would start by setting up the trusty 8-inch Dobsonian and then comparing it to the brand new 14-inch go-to Dobsonian. Okay, we just wait for the sun to go down.
This balance screw system worked out okay, but leave a comment below if you have an idea to improve it. Now that we've gone through the initial setup, it's asking us if we want to do an alignment. We say yes. And we're going to do the two-star alignment. And I'm going to pick Sirius because it's the easiest to find, and it's pointed at it right now, generally speaking. So we'll pick Sirius. It tells me where it's at. Okay, it wants me to put uh, Sirius in the eyepiece. Now, we're using this illuminated eyepiece right here. Uh, this was supposed to come with one, but it didn't, so I had to buy this extra. But it has little illuminated crosshairs. It's pretty cool. I'm going to line this up with Sirius right now. As soon as it goes to the crosshairs, I'll push the enter button. And three, two, one, and push enter. Okay, that's pretty close. Okay, now I choose the second star. I'm going to choose all the brawn. It's going to try to find it. Okay, let's get it uh, centered in the eyepiece it says. And three, two, one, and push enter. Okay, that's pretty close. Okay. All right, alignment was successful. All right, so we've got both telescopes set up with a magnification of in the, the mid-80s range. And this is the 8-inch Dobsonian right here. We've got it pointed at the Great Orion Nebula. So let's take a look. Well, it's pretty sharp. And you can see some of the cloud structure in the nebula. And you can definitely see the four stars that make up the trapezium. It's actually not bad, considering that we're in such... A really bad light pollution here. It's Bortle 8 here in our neighborhood. But let's take a look at the big telescope. The Orion Nebula. Messier 42. It's right on target and tracking, we're going to get a non-illuminated eyepiece. Okay, that's really sharp. I can see the six stars that make up the trapezium. You know, it's really cool to see the trapezium every time because it was first seen by Galileo on February 4th, 1617. It's hard to believe. I don't know how amazed he was, but it sure does amaze me. It's like a feast for the eyeballs, and you can see more cloud structure than you can see in the 8-inch Dobsonian. It's pretty impressive. I have to say, it still wilds me every time I see it. Oh, hey, I don't... Oh, wait a second. It looks like you haven't pushed the like button. Please go ahead and push the like button. It means the world to small channels like this. Thanks. Look at this, you know, my daughter crocheted this star during this series. Isn't that pretty awesome? It's actually got a smiley face on it with eyeballs. I thought that was pretty cool. I'm going to set it here so we can see it. Let's try it on something that I've never been able to do with any of my other telescopes, and that is to split Sirius. Now, you may know that Sirius is actually a double star, but Sirius itself is so bright that it overpowers its binary star that it's orbiting, or they're orbiting each other. So let's point this at Sirius, and according to the tips that I've seen, you put in the highest magnification eyepiece you have and point it at Sirius. We'll see if this one can split Sirius into its two stars. It's going to slip. I mean, I can find it, it's pretty easy, but it's needs to lift this go. There it is. A 
put in my strongest eyepiece, which is a three millimeter, which I think gives us a magnification of about 550. Uh, but they say to do that to find uh, to split Sirius. It's tracking Sirius right now. And to make sure it's in focus, we'll put the bat knot mask on. All right, it's in perfect focus. It's actually split serious. Uh, this is the first time I've ever seen this. It's very obvious. It's near one of the diffraction spikes, but it's a very obvious star, very dim. That is really, really cool. Um, you know, I'm gonna try and see if I can do this in the eight inch to see if I can get it, I doubt I can. Well, I think I can say that it works really, really well, but I'm gonna take this out another night because it's getting a little bit cold tonight. So let's pack it up. Now, I do have to admit something. Early on in the video series, I actually asked you to leave your opinion about the Telrad versus Red Dot Finder. And I have to admit, uh, during this whole test, I pretty much never touched the Red Dot Finder. I have fallen in love quickly with the Telrad, <laughs> but it's not for the obvious reason. Uh, the main reason is because, you know, the red dot, if, if brightness goes from zero to 100%, when you turn the red dot on, it's already at 50%. Um, it, it doesn't have a very dim setting. Maybe I'm just buying super cheap red dot finders, I don't know. But the Telrad is truly uh, zero to a hundred percent. When you turn it on, you can't say anything. And it has such amazing dimming that uh, you can set it just right. So depending on the amount of basically light pollution you have, you can make it super dim so that uh, it's barely visible compared to the stars that you're trying to find or the objects that you're trying to find. So uh, two thumbs up for the Telrad. Uh, I'm still going to use the red dot finder on my smaller telescopes, but I'll keep the Telrad on this big guy. Well, I have some good news and some bad news. The good news is that if you live in the city or on the edge of the city like I do, and you've purchased an eight inch Dobsonian telescope, well, congratulations, you're done. You don't need to buy anything else. That telescope's gonna last you a lifetime, and it's gonna give you 90% of the visual performance that you get out of this in the city. The bad news is, as I've learned, if you do live in the city with the light pollution like I do, then buying bigger and bigger telescopes is basically a futile mission. You're gonna be fighting an arms race against light pollution that you're going to lose, unfortunately. These telescopes are meant to be out in the country. They're meant to be out in the dark skies where they can just gobble in the light without any of the pollution giving that hazy gray glare. I did wanna quickly go over the pros and cons of the Orion XX14G, all right? These are the lessons that I've learned. Uh, let's talk about the pros first. The go-to system on this particular telescope works amazingly well. Uh, it took it to the targets uh, spot on. It works better than any go-to telescope that I've used before. So that's a big two thumbs up for me. The tracking also works really well. That's also a two thumbs up for me. I'll be honest, I don't really use the go-to feature as much as I do the tracking feature because I take pictures with the cell phone and you know the longer I can keep the object perfectly centered in the view the better the image is going to be on, on the cell phone. So the tracking system works great as well. Also the light gathering. You know between the two telescopes when I looked at the Orion Nebula this one saw a uh, very much more well-defined cloud shapes and, and, and cloud edges in the nebula. It was pretty darn cool. And also resolution. You know, this thing picked out the six stars that make up the trapezium lickety split. It was not a problem at all. And this one was able to split Sirius into its binary stars. And I I'll be honest, that was the first time I've ever seen that before. I've tried with the eight inch for a long, long time and I've never been able to split it. But let's talk about the cons. Really, it's just one thing. It's the weight. 
And the weight is more of a con than the size, because when you break this all down, it actually doesn't take up much more room than the 8-inch Dobsonian does. My 8-inch does not break down, and it's kind of a big, unwieldy thing. This thing breaks down into uh, very movable parts. There's just a lot of them. Now, I'll leave you with this bit of advice. You know, for many, many years, I've always been told that aperture was king. The bigger the telescope, the much better the view is going to be. And that is true if you're always in dark skies. But unfortunately, that rule of thumb breaks down when you live in the city with really bad light pollution. I would like to amend that rule of thumb. And here's how it is. Aperture is king, but dark skies are the emperor. You know, this restoration project started with a broken telescope. And it ended with a wonderful new toy and a lot of new supportive friends. Now, I'll admit that I got lucky on a few of the fixes, such as how the azimuth slop was repaired by just tightening up four loose bolts. But we sure did have to dig into the system to find where those four bolts were located. But was it all worth it? Well, you know, that's a question that I've actually been thinking a lot about. Did I pay too much for a broken telescope? Probably. Did cleaning that mirror add a lot of gray hairs to my head? Definitely. But did we have a lot of fun restoring this telescope? Absolutely. Together we learned about every aspect of every system that goes into making one of these computerized telescopes work. But most of all, I want to thank each and every one of you for joining me on this journey. And thank you for your wonderful questions and comments that you left below each of the videos. If you enjoyed this restoration series, feel free to share it with a thousand of your closest friends. But most importantly, take your telescope or your binoculars or just your eyeballs, go outside and look up into the night. Clear skies, everybody. Oh, and if you enjoyed this restoration series, be sure to watch this restoration series. I think you'll like it. Seriously, go ahead and push it.